Okay. So, um, so as David said, we try to, you know, reduce the heat. We are flying very high. That's good. <laughs> A little bit. And uh, because the the point is that. Um, I mean, wh why do we do schools? We do schools because to give the students the ability to understand what they need. You know, so there is a, a commercial that I always like very much. Power is nothing without control. It's the same. I mean, Yambo is a super powerful machine, and actually you can run it on GPUs on millions of cores. But I mean, can you control it? Can you control the physics? And uh, there is actually a, um, a presentation that I don't, I don't know if we will have time to do it, but I always love to do it at the beginning of the Yambo schools. It is about the, the, the procedure you have to do as a student or as a researcher to at the end calculate what you want to publish and then write what you want to evaluate. So in general, the, the simulation is at the end of, of, of a procedure. And along this procedure, there is the to identify what is the physical phenomenon you're interested in and to understand what is the theory and how you implement it. And along this, the, this path, there are assumptions, simplifications, discretizations, parameters. So it's a long way. And only, unfortunately, through this, um, through this way, you, you, you gain control of what you simulate at the end. If you start from the end, you produce numbers, but you don't have a control on these numbers. And more important, when, you, when do you realize it? You realize it when your numbers don't fit the experiment, right? So if it doesn't fit the experiment, what do you do? You write on the forum, say, oh, my gap is one EV off of the experiment. Yeah, but your gap is at the end of this, of this path. So there are assumptions. Are they good enough for your system? and the discretization. Did you do it properly? And only by uh, understanding the different steps you get control. So in this talk, I will try to, uh, I mean, take a simple man approach to the problem, trying to, um, to root what you calculate on physical intuition. Because otherwise, math is useful when you are to transform your physical intuition in something accurate and rigorous, but you need first an, an intuition. So first, bow particles. So what is the goal of physicists? I mean, I'm a, as a physicist, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a physicist. So what do I want at the end? I want to introduce new concepts that simplify my life and that also give me the opportunity to introduce simple concepts. And then one of this is clearly particles. I mean, can I introduce new particles to, to make life easier? Then while doing this, I will realize that on the way of introducing those particles, I, I will see that many body appears as fluctuations. And this will be the complication. But clearly, I will identify in those fluctuations what is needed to be described to introduce particles. Then I will move to the GW through the basic idea of GW. GW is a dielectric theory, and this is the good and the bad of the theory. It's dielectrics, and, and dielectric is a very simple concept. Anyone can understand it, and then you will see that when you apply it in practice, in, and then you extend it to just the optical absorption experiments, you get a proper definition of one possible definition of quasi-particles. Then we will see an important aspect of GW that is true and is exact in a specific limit. So GW is an exact self-energy, exact, is not an approximation in a specific limit. Then in general is not what, I, what is respected in a realistic material. And then if there is time, we will finish with a, a kind of different quasi-particles. Okay, bow particles. So now this is the Miltonian. Clearly, the problem is the Coulomb interaction, right? I mean, this is what makes life super complicated, the Coulomb interaction. And, uh, and, and then we need to find a way to describe the Coulomb interaction. But more importantly, we need to find this way in such a way to describe the observer we are interested in. So depending on the observable, I mean, the Hamiltonian has to be treated differently. This is important. So first, you have to decide what you want to calculate. 
I mean, do you want to calculate for you know, current transport? Jumbo cannot be used. It doesn't work. Period. Do you want to calculate upper bands? No, Jumbo is not good. You cannot use it. So first you need to understand what do I need? Once you know what do you need, you need to connect it to the Hamiltonian somehow. So defining observables. So up to now, we have introduced concepts and the concepts are a way to connect the physics to the math. So let's try to not introduce new concepts today in, the in my talk, in the sense that yesterday we have seen response functions in the talk of Margherita and diagrams with, the, with Gianluca and Rico. So can we use just those concepts to introduce physical, uh, uh, those tools to introduce physical concepts? Because the idea is the following, and actually, uh, uh, I mean, the goal we want to reach is very simple. So we have our Hamiltonian that is with the column interaction, and the column interaction is really a pain because the column interaction does such a way that anyone is connected with the other, and the worst of the column interaction is that it's long range. This is really a pain. I mean, it's the source of lots of interesting physical properties, but when you want to do theory, it's a pain because it's long range. So I cannot say that if I'm an electron, I will not interact with the electron that is now in St. Peter's Square. No, I will interact with the electron in St. Peter's Square because the column interaction goes just one over R. But then we say, but what happens if I remove the column interaction? Well, I have independent particles. And independent particles, everything is easy because I can rewrite everything by forgetting about all the others and solving the single particle problem, and then I get everything exact. Clearly, I would like to find something similar. And this is actually the Bohr particles, because let's imagine that somehow I can rewrite my full Hamiltonian as a bare Hamiltonian plus some interaction that does in such a way that the whole thing is still single particle, but single objects, those violet particles are not bare particles, are something else that are defined in such a way to be quickly interacting. So this is the goal, right? I mean, if you manage to get this goal, then you have a super powerful tool. Now, what is the theory that does this exactly? I mean, what is the theory that you should know that does this exactly, this single partialization of, of, the, of the problem? Come on, what is the theory that you do it, that does this exactly? Yes, Konisham, DFT, density functional theory, you do this uh, transformation of the full interacting system in, in, a, in, in a system of quasi bow particles. In those, case, in those cases, the particles are the Konisham levels. The point is that in that case, those Konisham levels are defined by having the same density, right? Just the density. But you want to get more of the density and that's where many body enters in the game. Right, so indeed, similarly to DFT, your goal is to define some mean field potential, some, uh, some object, some potential that describes the single particle level in such a way to reproduce the physics of the full interacting. And, 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 and the question is, what is V many body? So in order to understand what is this V many body, we need, first of all, to transform the interaction between electrons in something that we have to treat. So what is the problem? I and mean, why is it so complicated? I mean, from a mathematical point of view, simple mathematical point of view, why is it so complicated? So now, Let's imagine that in this room, we are all electrons, right? So I need to find a way to understand why the interaction between me and all the others will complify my dynamic, make my dynamics very complicated. In order to do that, you don't need very fancy tools. It's enough to have a commutation, anti-commutation relations. So let's define a simple Hamiltonian, right? Where you have a bare Hamiltonian, and then you make this a density matrix, so those are fermion, fermions interacting with some object. This object can be bosons or can be also whatever else. Just an object that at the moment we don't even need the commutation and anti-commutation relations. 
So this is our Hamiltonian, this psi is interaction. And then we want to calculate for this Hamiltonian the dynamics of the density matrix. So, ah, sorry, the interaction, the, the objects you interact with can be photons, phonons, or even electron pairs. It's always an in, a linear interaction. So if you do the, 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 you calculate the equation of motion, and then this use Heisenberg. I mean, it's, you can prove it in, a, in, in half an hour, I mean, 20 minutes, I mean, on a piece of paper. You do commutation, anti-commutation relations, and then you realize that when you do the equation of motion of this object, this operator, on the right, you get something that is like this. Is the product of the of this uh, original body and the body is interacting with, and this is the pain. This is the pain because this means that if I want to calculate my dynamics, my dynamics will be dictated by the interaction of me with all of you that in this case are described by this Q. So now you realize immediately what is the object you need to describe. Now, you say, now you will do all the math, and the, of course, if I do many body and diagrammatics, I, I can calculate this object, but this is not what I want to do in this lecture. We need to understand, I have a physical intuition on how we can uh, calculate this dynamics. What is the physics that's to enter here? First of all, we need to identify the two regimes. So, there is a classical regime where you assume that the two objects are not interacting. So this is classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, I move along a trajectory. If I want to go from this place to the end of the room, I just walk through, through a trajectory, and we don't interact each other. We don't interact with each other, and you appear just as an average. And this is what, uh, depending on the interaction and on the objects you interact with, produces Ehrenfest or Archery. So Ehrenfest is just the first term. Now, if you can rewrite exactly this object as the classical, plus this, you see, this delta is the fluctuation, is the change, is the variation of this operator with respect to the classical average. So this object is the fluctuations and it is the many body, what is needed to describe from the many body. So quasi particles, if they appear, the definition would be due to this object. Now, this distinction, I think, is very instructive. Uh, okay, it's only one slide, and, and I need time, and then have time to enter in details. But the difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics and the so-called, what we are naming coherence and incoherent regime, it is very essential. When you do the physics, when you want to describe something, in general, it's not enough to just uh, use one tool, like quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, it's not enough. In general, to reach the observable, the one that is observed by the experiment, you have to put together several concepts. This is quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, eventually electromagnetism. In the case of accidents, for example, electromagnetism plays a big role. You cannot describe accidents with just a poorly quantistic theory. So, but to, to get this, you need to have a picture. So now, let's try to get some physics of this object, right? Ah, okay, but this is what I was talking about. So the, the, this is the source of the coherence. So you have displacements of electromagnetic fields. And actually, to go to accidents, you need to invoke also Maxwell. And this is that determined that this, about fluctu that this is about fluctuation. Right. So now, let's try to connect this fluctuation to the electrics. So in this case, I will not be very formal. Sorry for that. I will be informal, I mean, and use some, some intuitive concept. Because, I mean, the goal of, of the derivation now is rooted on an intuition. So what is my intuition? My intuition is that if I want to go from this place to the end of the room, I mean, the interaction with you will depends, will depend on your density. I mean, if you are just few in this room, of course, if the interaction, there is an interaction, while going from one side to the other, I will interact singularly with you, right? So it will be an interaction with a single, because you are, you know, sitting in different places of this room. But if you are many, and then I walk through, what happens? The people will move away, right? And you will create sort of collective excitation. So this is the, the, the difference. I mean, if you enter in a, 
in, a, in an elevator with lots of people. Then you see lots of people moving away and, and just drifting away to, to make room for you. So this picture where you will appear to me as a collective object is the dielectric approach. And it is, it is an approach to calculate this term. So let's see. Now, let's transform this object we are interacting with with another electronal pair so that the uh, fluctuation part of the dynamics becomes a density-density object. So this density-density evaluation object operator is what is describing the interaction between the different particles. So now let's do a Gedanken experiment. Let's now perturbe our Hamiltonian with an external uh, density operator interacting with the field. Now, without doing any many body, we know that the system will react by changing and dressing the total density through the response function. This is Kubo. So I'm assuming that external field is tiny and whatever. But I mean, what the system is doing, as soon as you perturb the system with an external charge, an external charge in this case is the Gedanken experiment I need to prove my intuition. Because now I, I take a person, I put it inside here, and this person is the external charge. How will you react to this external uh, perturbation? And then you will interact by this response function. That actually, it is a fluctuations part. So this means that this charge that will enter in the, in the room will be screened by all of you and actually will produce an induced potential. That actually it is a solution, a solution of Poisson. So at this point, by using this simple uh, um, Kubo relation, you can prove on a piece of paper that the effect of the interaction of the interaction, so the, the column interaction, is actually to screen the external potential. So H will go, the, the uppercase H will go in the independent particle plus a screen interaction between the external, poten the external charge and, and the external potential. So, but this is what I, what, what, what I was, need, was I was having in mind. So within Kubo, that I use the Kubo uh, linear response picture, Within Kubo, the interaction can be replaced by a screening reaction by all of you through the dielectric function defined in terms of response function. But then this means that this charge entering the room will feel a screen interaction that defines the column, the, the, bur, the, the screen and uh, electron electron interaction. This picture of the dielectric approach to many body has been formalized in a paper by Allen, Cole, and Penn. Then you can find the definition of the total dielectric function and how the, uh, using a variational argument, you can prove that in the dielectric material, two charges will interact through a screen interaction. So this is this, this is the GW. So in the GW, what you assume is that the dominant role is played by the screening and this screening will affect the interaction between elemental particles. So now, if you do this, then you're almost done. Because say, but I know an approximation that is very simple, artery fog. In artery fog, I have the classical artery plus the exchange fog operator. In the exchange fog operator, I have in both the Berkulum interaction, but this is the classical part. And the classical part is not affected by fluctuations while the quantistic part is the fog. So what I can do at a very elemental level, a very intuitive level, I can say, you know what? This picture, Kubo picture, dielectric picture that replaces V with the screen interaction affects this energy. So I can introduce a screening of the fog induced by quantistic effects and produce a so-called screened fox, where the, the, the sigma will be still some of occupied levels, blah, 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 W. Well, this is GW. GW in practice is a screen artifact. And the elemental physics of GW is just what I told you. I mean, it is a, a case where fluctuations are replaced by dielectric screening. So once you have, then you can prove GW with the diagrams, you can prove GW with the, 
Schwinger approach, you can do everything. You can introduce vertex corrections and blah, blah, blah. But the important point is that it is a dielectric theory. So then your question now is, I have to calculate blah, this observable. And then I am in a system where in the system, is the dielectric picture working or not? So an example is, you want to calculate something or quasi-particle or whatever in a system with localized orbitals, like F orbitals or D orbital. So is the dielectric picture working in the systems? Well, I mean, it is not really uh, diffused. I mean, they are not just, there are some orbitals that are really localized. So if you think in terms of the picture I give you of the elevator, some of the orbitals are isolated somewhere. And this is not the picture I'm using to, to use the Kubo. So in that case, could be that the GW is not a proper approach. So this is important to keep in mind. So the, 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 the physical intuition, the physical picture that is behind GW is based on the, on the dielectric approach. Okay. Now, how do you, how do you introduce it then? What, this is the general, the general idea. What is the general physical uh, picture? Of course, another important step in the, in, in, in the process I told you at the beginning, besides having the connection between what you want to calculate and, and the theory, you need to also to understand what are the limitations. So the GW, this dielectric approach, is, are there any limit, any regimes where it is exact? Because of course, I'm neglecting other processes. For example, the single scattering between, uh, between bodies, they are neglected because all the bodies appear in terms of screening, collective object. So other limits where this is an exact theory, yes, it is in a monogenous electron gas. Okay, this is diagrams, just to say I wouldn't use diagrams. And if you calculate the diagrams in the homogeneous electron gas, you realize that some of the diagrams in homogeneous electron gas are divergent like this bubble as yeah, one over Q squared, Q is the momentum. So this is divergent. And uh, of course, if it is divergent, this means that it's very big. So just briefly, I wanted to tell you that the GW can be introduced as an exact theory, but it is an exact theory because it's summation of divergent diagrams. Now, of course, I, now I will tell you more. Uh, it's important that you keep in mind that in, in a piece of silicon, there are no divergent diagrams. In, in a piece of aluminum or, I don't know, MGB2 or MOS2. So in, when you go to realistic materials, the limits that where the GW is exact, they are not valid anymore. So you just know that the theory is exact in a limit that is not respected by realistic materials. So, okay, you sum all the bubbles because every bubble gives a divergent contribution. If you sum all the bubbles and you define the screen interaction, from a, from a diagrammatic point of view, you get something that is regular. So this means that the GW approximation is the sum of the most divergent and so dominant diagrams in high density limit. So this is the regime where the GW is exact. And you understand that from a physical point of view, it respects the dielectric picture we had at the beginning because it is the regime where the density in this room is so high that the only way to move is to move all together. So in the high density regime, you produce mostly collective excitation. Okay. Um, an important thing of the GW is that we have introduced it from a very general Hamiltonian, right? The interaction, in the, in the original Hamiltonian, there is an interaction between an electron au pair and something that can be real bosons or another electron au pair. This means that the, all we have discussed up to now, the dielectric approach and blah, 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 is very general. So you can, you can you find in the literature different kind of GW self-energies. And uh, so depending on the thing you are interacting with, you have GW in the case of electron au pairs, but the GW self-energy is a, as a, just a different name in the case of, of, of phonons, is the fan self-energy. So the fun of energy is the GW of the electron phonon problem. And, and the lump, the, 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 I mean, the, the lowest of energy that gives rise to the lump shift, 
the, the correction to the electronic level pseudophotons is the GW self energy in the electron photon case. So it is very general. And actually, to, to, to describe uh, the, uh, to introduce the quasi particle picture and also the correction to the quasi particle picture, I find it much more intuitive to use the electron phonon case. Because in the electron phonon case, there are lots of calculations and, uh, and, and uh, it's very instructive. So in the, the fun self energy, it is using the same machinery of GW, just that the interaction is three bosons. I mean, this is phonons, this is the displacement of the phonon mode. So if you do the GW, you get, you see GW, but the W is the Ds, the propagator of the phonons, and you can write the fan self energy exactly. So the GW in the electron boson case is the fan self energy. So what is very nice is that in that case, it's much more easy to see the different kind of particles so and solutions. So the quasi-particle picture, what is the quasi-particle picture? The quasi-particle picture is what you get when you use the self-energy to calculate the Green's function, and you want to find the poles of this Green's function. So the Green's function is the marginal part of Green's function, it's the spectral function. So this means that the peaks of the spectral function are the poles of the complex Green's function, and the poles are found one way is through linear expansion. This is the Newton solver. When you use the linear expansion, if you plug it inside here, you see immediately that the Green's function acquired this form with one pole and a normalization factor. And this defines the, you know, the zoology of the particles. So you have a real particle when, I mean, con sham is a delta function, zero width. Then you have a quasi particle when you have a Lorentzian. This produces Lorentzian. This E is complex, and the marginal part is the uh, quasi particle width you have a Lorentzian with a certain weight. So this is the quasi-particle. So a quasi-particle is, as a matter of fact, what you get from the spectral function when it, it has this simple form. You see a specific, a well-defined peak with some width. Now, physically, if you think in terms of, of physics, you, when you introduce a quasi-particle, you understand how the GW is an approximated theory. Because the Z, for example, Z is, is less than one. In general, to be a good quasi-particle has to be above 0 0.5. If it is below 0 0.5, you say that the quasi-particle is broken. Um, but this means that the integral of, of this region is Z, but the integral of the spectral function has to be one. So this means that there are other excitations that are besides the quasi-particle picture. So, the quasi-particle is an approximation, is as valid as the weight under the peak is high. But then you can actually, with the, with, with the electron phone interaction, you can tune the validity of the, of the, of the quasi-particle picture, and then if you increase the strength, you can easily see the appearance of additional peaks. And that this means that you cannot identify anymore a single peak but the, the, there are lots of structures. And this means that there is not sharp on dominant pole that collects most of the weight. And uh, I mean, physically, this can be, I think that's very instructive, this paper by, um, by Schrieffer and Engelsberger about a couple of electron phonon systems. So this is for students, this is very good. I mean, if you want to understand the quasi-particle picture and the, and the, the validity, this 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 paper is nice because you can do the math yourself. You can even write a Python code to redo the spectral functions. So in this case, you can calculate exactly the fan self energy for homogeneous electron gas, and you can calculate the spectral functions. And you see that the spectral functions check at the at the at the at the values here. You see it's 0 0.06 is tiny. So this is a case, and this change it depends on the energy of the electron you calculate the spectral function for. So you can move from a case where you have most of the weight in the delta function and choose tiny sidebands to a case where you have lots more weight in the sidebands. And then you can have a transition between a quasi-particle to a non-quasi-particle picture, changing the strength of the electron phonon. And it's a toy model that, that, that gives you a really feeling of, of when the quasi-particle picture is valid or not. Okay, I think that for this, I concluded in um, yeah
That's it. So, session is open for questions. If you have any, please. So maybe uh, I start with uh, a comment and remark that uh, so you, you have shown uh, it uh, was uh, uh, very nicely that uh, indeed the GW is uh, in a way a screened artery fork and they, it is somehow amazing that uh, after so many years uh, of uh, simulations, ab initio simulations is still the core of what we can do now. Even if you think to DFT, many of the tries to improve it is through hybrid functional to put some fraction of, ex of exchange. GW is uh, mostly the same concept. Yeah. So why, I mean, the, so if you want to actually understand how to go beyond the fact that you need to do other interactions, I mean, that's one of case, the, it's more easy to go beyond the gap. But it's clearly not still clear why it works so well. But clearly calculation, a huge calculation. Yeah, but... Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, one question. You had one uh, plot uh, where you have multiple peaks, so not one single quasi particle, but um, yeah, this one, this green one. Um, would you say in this case um, it's uh, three different quasi particles, or is this quasi particle picture broken? Yes, 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 exactly. So for a quasi -peak, for the quasi -peak picture to be valid you must have that this the original particle that's to be dressed must maintain the identity. So this means that in the GW, you can clearly define this column hole around the electron and, and exchange. So you can really see that the electron is surrounded by a cloud of electron no pairs. So this means that if I go far from this electron, I will see an effective charge. This charge has to be reasonable, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. If it is too, too, too low, this means that the particle is not able to maintain the identity. So it, this means that as a quantistic system, it can appear in different forms. Different forms you said using actually using the Lehman representation. If you do the Lehman representation of the emitter, because the Green's function is the inverse, is the resolvent of the Hamiltonian. So if you do the lemon, you will see that those states that are the true states of the system, the systems, in order to produce a quasi-particle, they have to be distributed statistically around the quasi-particle. So that is Lorentz-like. But if this the, the interaction is strong, it may happen that there are other states where the different uh, probability of the elemental excitation is different. So, for example, in the Polaroni case, you can have that there is one quasi-particle state with one phonon, but there is another quasi-particle state with two phonons, three phonons, four phonons, and so on and so forth. Mm. And if the, the, the charge of the main peak is too tiny, this means that the electron is not able to stay alone anymore. Mm. It's not able. So it has to live with something else, and you don't have quasi-particles anymore. It's a very simple in physical intuitive mm. picture. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there is another question from the back. Um, thank you very much. So at some point throughout my studies, I heard the concept that uh, a quasi-particle is well-defined when the dispersion relation is well-defined. So the energy depends on the quasi-momentum. And, um, and now this is another, let's say, definition of on when the picture is valid. Would you say these two are more or less the same things? No, 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 no. Because in this case, I'm talking about an energy definition, not rather a momentum definition. So when, uh, by dispersion relation, I mean the, the energy defined, the energy dependence on momentum and other things. Well, why do you say that, that also this will affect the 
quasi particle definition um so what, what do you mean when when is it broke i mean in this dependence of energy and momentum so when when the energy is well defined um for example for the excitons when we have below the um conduction band we have those discrete levels which right. are kind of parabolic and they're well defined with the momentum right. those were examples when we used of of clear quasi particles let's say clearly defined or um, well defined quasi particles right so is this description related it's still, it's still an energy is it still energy based so for the accidents within the gap, you say this, okay, accidents is tricky because most of the accidents are resonant with electronal pairs. So actually they are very <coughs> wide structures above the optical gap. For particles, you have a similar situation. I mean, quasi-particles quasi are quasi-particles because they are resonant with something. <coughs> are they, they are resonant with electronal pairs or they are resonant with phonons. So it's this resonance that produces the broadening. The broadening because the system has several uh, states with a similar energy to be accessed. And <coughs> as we are in a quantistic description that is statistical base, there will be different probabilities to be in those different similarly uh, and with similar energy states. Mm. Okay, that clears up. Thank you. Maybe if I can just add a comment on this. So I think the, the two are pretty related to definition in the sense that if you look to the plot of Andrea, in the case where we have a, a well-defined quasi-particles, so the blue area, then is that for a specific k-point, no? Then you define for each k-point, the maximum is, is your band dispersion, with, it will have a width. Then when you move to the green case, your band will basically become very, let's say, smeared out and you, you lose the, the band. So. So, are there other questions? Yeah. So, just one, just one comment. I mean, one way to see the breakdown of the quasi picture is even with Yambo. You ask Yambo to calculate the spectral function of an electron that is 10 EV above the Fermi level. I mean, it's a pancake. So, the quasi-particle picture is, in most of the cases, valid near the Fermi level, where indeed the number of states with a similar energy are not so many. If you go in a high study state, I remember one, I mean, just, just a smooth, stupid story. When I was a PhD like you, I was invited to give a talk at a German conference in Germany. And then I showed to the experimentalists the spectral function of an electron, like 10 EV or both. And then I couldn't finish my talk. They just stopped me. I said, oh, that's bullshit. I mean, of course, you don't see it. Yeah, I know that that is above the work function that goes out. But this is what is GW. So, I mean, it's enough that you go that 10 EV above when there are lots of states and then boom. I wanted to ask, but you said that GW is surprisingly exact, surprisingly close to experiment, but in metal organic Perov's case, PBE was approximately equal to the experiment, then GW pushed it over one EV and then BSC put it back. Could you please explain what will be uh, the reasons in the atomic structure that will fail GW approximation? I mean, at the moment, GW, I mean, all the methods that, that are coded in Yambo, they are based on a so-called, I mean, as a um, community validation. It's tricky. I mean, there are papers, lots of papers that have applied Yambo and Abinit and Bus to many different systems. And they create a sort of, I mean, validation, de facto validation. But as a matter of fact, given the material, you don't have any way to predict that the gap will be uh, exact or not, or good or not, because you didn't have a control on the validity of the approximations of the GW in the realistic materials. So most of the PB is the same, also the, the hybrid functionals. So, I mean, you don't know, I mean, you don't know from the beginning, you have just lots of applications on lots of different systems they create a community knowledge that that system applied in that method applied in many systems is reasonably good. Okay, so we also have a question from just the remote. A, just, a, just a, um, a comment uh, on the question of Mila that I think that uh, organic perovskite is not good example 
to prove a theory because uh, there you have uh, a lot of more um, phenomena appearing as disorder, disorder uh, motion of the cation are all uh, uh, phenomena that have been addressed in the literature. It's not easy to treat. Uh, so um, one shot calculation, either PB or GW, uh, you are not in a experimental and realistic condition. Okay, so there is a question from, from the remote audience. I try to read the question and uh, it says, uh, when studying uh, bands theory in the very basic uh, quasi-free electron limit, uh, one can find a close comparison with, with experimental data coming from metallic systems. What would be the crudest theoretical approach to the electronic excitation problem that would offer a, a close resemblance uh, to experimental curves for some well-behaved systems. So I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think the question is if you have, uh, I don't know, some realistic material, uh, which would be the suggested approximation to, to get a good man structure, if I, I can rephrase. I, I think that the best is to search for similar systems of the family where GW has been applied. Has it been successful or not? Also, because I mean the the I mean the oxides where GW does not apply, they're an extreme case. But in the middle, there is all an, an entire you know a family of materials that go from a stupid semiconductor SP semiconductor to uh, a, a D or F oxide, and then in this realm, GW can have a very different performance. So it's a matter of understand whether the physical general, I mean, picture of GW that is dielectric is valid or not. Okay, so are there other questions?